In the last year, my max backhand distance has grown 75 to 100 feet, and my average distance has grown a solid 50 to 60 feet. And here's how. Hey everybody, what is up? It's Antonio. Welcome to episode 26 of Teach Play Disc Golf, a Gladiator Disc Golf podcast. I am so excited for today's show. I have a really, really fun tip that I'm going to share with you, and it's really how I've been building this distance over the last year and just compounding one thing after another. And then after I talk about that, I'm going, I, I have a disc, as you can see, for those of you watching the video, I have a disc in the background. It's the Innova Aero, the first disc, 40 year edition. I am going to review it, hopefully next week. I have not been able to spend as much time throwing it in the last week or so, like I would have hoped I would have been able to, and I just don't feel confident enough to be able to review it yet, so I have the disc, I've thrown it a little bit. I want to throw it some more this week. And then in next week's episode, I will go ahead and review that for you. So just wanted to give you a little preview. We'll be talking about the Innova Aero next week. After, well, I mean, that was kind of the disc review, but basically after where we would normally have the disc review, we're going to recap pretty quickly Jim, Jim Palmieri's 50th AFDO presented by Dynamic Discs. Uh, I have some cool thoughts on that. Not a ton to say, but some cool thoughts. But most importantly, most importantly, one of the things that I am so excited about for this episode, we have the World Championships. Three days from the time that I'm recording this, if uh, I get this out on Tuesday like I plan, or Wednesday, I have to figure out what, what I, or I have to kind of decide what I think would be best. It'll either be the next day or the day of. We have the World Championships. I am so excited. I will actually come to think of it, probably publish this on Tuesday. That way on Wednesday, we can all be watching the World Championships. But I am so, so excited. I have some stuff I want to talk about in regard to that. And uh, yeah, that is episode 26. So let's go ahead and let's get right into it. Okay, one of the things that I've been seeing a lot on uh, Instagram lately is this idea of creating lag in your throw. Uh, I know Ty Rilados has talked about it. Another account I follow is Cade Caps. I know he has talked about it. And this is something that I have talked similarly about on my channel, not necessarily explicitly. I did make a reel and a in a YouTube short a few weeks ago that kind of talked about my experience with creating lag, but this is something that I've been working on a little more recently, but everything that's been building into it is really this cascading effect. And last year, I had a, I spent about one to two hours with Cade and just breaking down my form and, you know, spending time at the field and I recorded that video and I want to touch on some of those things. I believe I've touched on it before already on the show, but I want to remind us all about that because that whole cascading effect is how we're going to create the right amount of lag, and it's really how we're going to get more distance. So you'll notice incremental things, uh, incremental increases in your distance when you do each of these components to the cascade effect. But overall, the cascading effect is all about creating that lag. So first things first, if you want to get more distance before we even talk about form, there's a few things. One, you need to be patient. When you are looking to improve distance with good form, okay, you're not going to maybe notice any distance changes. You might actually find, depending on what your current form is, that you stop, you're not even throwing as far. Uh, if you were constantly always throwing uh, overstable discs on Anheuser and getting flex shots out of that, now when you go to throw a slower, more neutral disc uh, with throwing it flat or throwing a little hyzer flip, you may notice you're not getting nearly as much distance. So all that to say, I wanna just encourage you to be patient okay you you are when you do this the right way and you're having to break bad habits and form new habits you have to be patient 
And you have to understand that there are going to be plateaus and there are going to be spikes in your improvement. It's not going to be uh, a consistent increase, okay, in your skill, talent, and in your distance. So I say all that because the best way for us to work till we get the end result that we want is to understand what the road's going to be like. And success is not linear. It goes up and down, up and down. So that being said, the first thing that we need to do is start from the ground up when we're talking about form itself. Obviously, being in the right headspace is super important, but we need to start from the ground up, okay? And you do that by initiating your hips. Now I know we've had engaging the hips, initiating the hips, using your hips to throw, and there's been uh, there's been commentary on this idea that maybe differs. Uh, some people have said one thing, some have said another, but at the end of the day, whether you want to call it engaging the hips, initiating the hips, gliding, like I like to call it, whatever you want to call it, you need to get your lower body involved. If your lower body is not involved in the disc golf backhand throw, you are not getting as much power into your throw as you possibly can. Whether or not you you know, call it a different phrase or a term, doesn't matter. You have to get your lower body involved, okay? And so we need to get those knees going, get the get the hips going, getting basically our the, the trunk of our body, the hips and the core really engaged in this throw. Now, that is the first thing. I, you know, we didn't talk about necessarily where your toes are pointing and all that kind of stuff because we're focusing on the big pieces here. Go ahead and fill in the details of everything else I'm saying. I'm not going into every tiny detail. I'm just hanging the big ones here, okay? So initiating the hips. Then we're gonna move up the body a little bit, okay? As you're, once you get those hips going, the next thing you want to do, and I've heard some people differ, but a compact throw is the most efficient throw. It's something I've taught for a long time. It's something you see every professional disc golfer do they have a compact throw, and even overthrow teaches this, Robbie teaches this, uh, any other instructional disc golf channel worth their salt teaches this, that compact throw. One of the things that I like to do to make the throw nice and compact is to bring that non-throwing elbow, which for me is my left arm, so righty backhand, so my left arm bringing that left elbow into your side. Okay, the hand can come down, the hand can go inside your pot, you know, like inside your hip, stay outside your hip. There are pros who put it on the outside of their thigh to help them keep that elbow nice and compact. It doesn't matter so much what you do with your non throwing hand. The most important thing is that you get that elbow coming into your side. All right, and the reason for that is as you bring that elbow into your side after initiating the hips, it's transferring all that energy and power up your core and up your body and getting that arm into it is going to start helping the motion to seemingly, it's going to look like it, you're not actually doing this, but it's going to look like you're now pulling the disc across your chest because that momentum is coming up. It's that cascading effect block after block after block after block. So it starts in the legs and the hips. It comes up by using your non-throwing elbow to come into your side. Now we're going to skip all the way to the top of your body, your head. This is super important to the cascading effect as well. Where you are looking, if you look at your target too long, you can't get a nice solid rotation with your torso. And if you turn too early, you're going to lose your target and you're more than likely going to round because you're looking backwards. So what we want to do, okay, if I'm looking at the camera, all right, is you want to look perpendicular. So if I'm looking at the camera and I'm throwing in the direction of where my right hand, you know, would naturally throw, okay, I'm gonna be looking at the camera and let the disc come across. I wanna keep my head and neck still. I wanna keep it perpendicular to the target. So I'm using the peripheral in my right eye to so to speak, have the target in line and the peripheral in my left eye to be keeping the disc out and away and extended from my body. It is super important to look perpendicular to your target. Don't look completely behind you. You're going to end up rounding, okay? 
So keeping that head in line, that spine in alignment is going to help with the cascading effect because as those hips come, as that non-throwing elbow comes, it's all going to start transferring from the back part of your body as your back foot comes off the ground, you're going to now glide into your plant foot. Okay, so we're now looking back down at the lower at the lower body. You're going to glide into your plant foot and there comes a point in your throw when you are on one foot that is actually out in front of you, so you look like you're imbalanced, but your momentum is bringing you, by gliding into your plant foot, it's bringing you onto that one leg. So, and then you're obviously going to have your follow through, which will help you regain your balance, but it is super important to be gliding into that plant foot. Um, the way I like to teach gliding is I have, uh, I grew up playing basketball, I played a little bit of organized, but I mainly played street ball. And I like to think of gliding as sort of like a crossover, okay? Your weight is shifting, okay? But you're not necessarily bouncing from one side to the other. It is all a smooth transition of your body weight. So whether you're, uh, you played baseball, Think about gliding your hips when you're swinging, okay? When you're when you're shifting in the field, reacting to a to a hit, okay? Volleyball, very similar to basketball with the lower body movement, the shuffling, the gliding of the hips. Same with football and soccer. Hip mobility is very important. And so by gliding into your plant foot, it is this continuation of this cascading effect. Otherwise, if you stay on your back foot, you're gonna end up popping the disc up. Okay, so you want to get off that back foot, glide into your plant foot with a neutral spine, and that's going to help the disc come out nice and level and flat like you're wanting it to, especially when you're holding the disc correctly on your extension and you're keeping the nose down among other things. So that was a lot. All right, that was a lot. So now I'm going to do give you a quick recap right now to create the cascading effect which will eventually lead to lag, and I'll get into that detail here, but right now that cascading effect, start from the ground up by initiating your hips. Bring that non-throwing elbow into your side. Keep your eyes perpendicular to your target, glide into your plant foot, and then follow through. Now, you probably noticed something. None of the steps that I just mentioned had anything to do with the arm or the hand or whatever you, you prefer to focus on in, in this appendage that is holding the disc. None of the steps mentioned anything about that, okay? And that's because our throwing arm is passive in the backhand, okay? It's passive in the backhand. Now, I do not believe that you're, it's some kind of limp noodle, all right, I do believe uh, from my experience and from talking with people like that there is a an appropriate amount of awareness, maybe tension or just rigidity, okay? And what I mean by that is not that you're clenching your muscles or flexing your muscles. You're not doing that. What I, what I mean is that you are using your, your throwing arm to obviously keep it elevated. You're wanting to keep it extended out. There is some muscular engagement in that. And also in, as your back is coming through, your, your body's going to naturally engage these muscles. It is not going to be a complete, a complete limp noodle when you throw, all right? But it is passive, okay? And this is really why it's, so difficult, every person is going to have to kind of figure out the feeling for themselves. You will find that sweet spot if you start by keeping your arms super loose and then kind of working to find, okay, how much do I actually need to control my arm in the sense of keeping it on the line that I wanna throw it without actually throwing with my arm? Let your body guide your arm to figure that out. And this is where the lag comes into play. So the way I've been able to get so much distance in my throat is because of all the cascading effect that I've talked about. And now that I've been implementing more and more lag, I've seen another jump in my distance, all right? Here's how it happens. As you're getting that lower body going, you're getting that non-throwing elbow coming into your side. As that 
elbow is coming into your side, the disc is going to be somewhere around your back. Uh, from my experience, it's going to be moving from your back shoulder to your front uh, pec, okay? So it's in that moment, as that disc is coming, as your elbow is coming into that side, your body's going to naturally be rotating the torso and your arm, your throwing arm is going to follow suit. And you're going to form what we like to call the power pocket. Now it's going to happen in a split second. The power pocket doesn't last very long because for it to happen, the disc has to be in front of your back shoulder. But by the time the disc is coming out, your elbow should be staying up and the disc is actually in front of your right pec as it starts to come out at what I call the 10 o'clock. If, you're, if the, where you're throwing is you know, the face of a clock, it's not coming out directly at 12 because that's where your shoulder is facing. It's about 10 or 11 o'clock. That is where that lag comes from. And at that point, you are on your plant foot. Your back foot is off the ground. You've engaged the hips. You've glided into your plant foot. And your non-throwing elbow is into your side working on that follow through. It creates that lag. Now, here's the thing about the lag. It is momentary. It should not be something where you're doing your X step or your standstill and you kind of have this like three second pause to really like yank the disc. If you have too long of a lag or pause in your throw, you're going to end up muscling the disc, which is obviously not what we want. Muscling the disc is how you hurt your arm. But if you work on this lag, you will feel a short pause in your throw. And it's going to, the disc is going to feel like it's coming out faster with less effort. And that's because you've hit that perfect lag, that perfect pause in your throw where you're not using your arm to pull the disc across your chest, but your body is rather guiding the disc to come across your chest. This is super important and it takes a lot of time. So, to get the most benefit out of something like this, I highly recommend that you use a throwing net. Um, going to a field and working on this, if you don't have a net, is fine. Just know you're going to want to be focusing on reps here and not so much what the disc is doing in the air. And then you're going to, and so if you're throwing in a field without a net, you're going to have to go retrieve all those discs. And then also what I have found, both in my experiences and talking with other uh, amateur disc golfers, is when you're working on form but you see the disc flying down the fairway, you begin to uh, distract yourself from the purpose of what you are there to do. And so having a throwing net erases and completely um, eliminates disc flight which is exactly what you want when you're working on form in the beginning. Eventually, you want to see how the disc is responding when you're working on form, but as you're making the initial changes, you want to have some kind of throwing net, okay? The net that I use, I like it a lot. It's a pitching net, and it has a square pocket that catches the disc. I've seen other disc golfers use flat nets. I know there's an actual company out there that is making it a net for disc golf. I don't like the ones that are entirely flat because I just feel like the disc is going to rebound off it. I like having the pocket. Now, the one downside to the pocket is that it may force you to kind of think about aiming lower than you normally would since the batter's box, so to speak, is a little bit lower than your release point. If you can work past that mentally. I know I have. It doesn't affect where I'm necessarily aiming when I throw because it will still catch it from the top down. So um, I, the one I recommend, you can get it on Amazon. It's uh, by Pl uh, Go Play Goes. What is it? Pl Go Play Sports or something like that. It's on Amazon. It's the uh, what is it? This six foot by six foot net or something like that with the baseball pocket. Um, I have really enjoyed it. It's been super helpful in developing my form over the last year and working on these things because I can record myself throwing uh, into the net without worrying about the flight of the disc. And truthfully, when you're trying to create lag, when you're trying to work on this cascading effect, that is what you want. That is what you need to have 
uh, information on your form, not on what the disc is doing. Eventually you'll get there, okay? You don't only wanna practice with a net, but if you're starting this brand new, try to get a net or find someone who has a net or, you know, I know some people use sheets uh, or like blankets. If you have a garage, you can throw into a blanket, whatever works for you. So that being said, and I've kind of touched on this, so I won't spend too much time. My experience from the last couple of weeks as I've been focusing more on implementing lag has been a little all over the place, to be honest. As I'm trying to get more lag, I have found that sometimes I end up um, keeping the disc f uh, too far back for too long, and I end up having uh, an early release in the result of the throw, even though I held on to it for longer, so it kind of early releases out on me. And then the other thing that I've uh, seen is that by really trying to get some good lag, I end up holding it back a little too long as well, but this time I end up pulling the disc or thinking that I, or, or I feel like I'm pulling the disc, which results in a grip lock and I miss my line. And so really this is why I'm saying like, hey, don't, th it's a momentary pause, it happens quickly, it's not, you know, it's not one, two, three seconds long. It's fairly quick in the throw, but you don't want to focus on overemphasizing the lag because it's going to throw it off. That being said, as you start to dial it in, like I've been learning to dial it in, you're going to have these learning curves. Um, even though I've had some shots that are a little bit early, some shots that are a little bit late, the vast majority of my throws have been online They've been clean. They've been coming out with more power, all right? And I feel like I'm throwing the disc easier. I'm throwing it smoother. I'm throwing it with better form, and I'm allowing my body to do the work and allowing that cascading effect to actually take effect in my throw. So it's been really, really cool. I am super excited to see what the next several months are going to be like. Um, I have not hit 400 feet yet. Uh, actually, I've hit 400 plus feet once, but it was a slight downhill hole. I had a flippy disc and I had a, a good helping wind and I have not been able to repeat that, <laughs> okay? It wasn't some super steep downhill hole, but um, for the vast majority of a lot of my other longer throws, I've been getting somewhere between, you know, 340 and 360 upward to 380 on some of these max distance lines um, or just max distance throws, which has been really, really cool because it hasn't only been with drivers. I've gotten some of my furthest throws the last three months with the mid range, okay? Specifically the peace train, which if you haven't gotten from OTB discs, you absolutely need to get. There's only a few left on that website, so go pick it up. Um, I've hit 350 plus with the peace train multiple times. It absolutely booms, it is so easy to throw. But that has been my experience. Is my distance cons uh, entirely consistent yet? No, but that is because I'm still dialing these things in. I am really excited for the next couple of months. I'm hoping that come the end of the year, I will have a good, solid, consistent, like, hey, I'm hitting 350 with ease, 360 with ease, and I'm touching 400 on some of those long distance shots, which these words coming out of my mouth, it's so hard to believe because a year ago, I was just wanting to hit 300 consistently. And I could barely do that. I mean, it took everything I had and sometimes that wasn't enough. Um, I could easily do 260, 270, you know, on distance, uh, but it wasn't necessarily great form. And just seeing the growth and now talking about how it's like, yeah, I've hit 350 t earlier today. I threw a nice uh, wooded, fairway line 360 with the jackalope and it was gorgeous and it's just so hard to like you know to actually believe that i'm doing this now and you know it just takes work it takes patience you're going to have days and weeks and months where you just feel like giving up because it's never going to happen but i just want to encourage you from my own experience just keep working through it Keep using the tips that I'm sharing with you and teaching you and you will get there.
okay as long as you're giving yourself the the patience and the grace as you work on this and then doing the right things at the right time with working on new skills and making sure you have a solid foundation with before you start a new skill with whatever the previous skill is you were working on you want to make sure you have all that so that is uh that was I I uh, talked about that a lot longer than I thought, but it's so much information to squeeze uh, to squeeze into a short segment that uh, the segment definitely went longer <laughs> than I was expecting. But that being said, if you need some help with this and watching videos, listening to the podcast, it's it's making sense, but you're having a hard time doing it yourself. Go ahead and send me a video on GiveGo. Um, it's a coaching app. I will coach you. You will send me a video of you throwing, and I will give you feedback. I'll be uh, talking to you. I'll be editing the screen, showing you what you need to work on, how you can do that. And it is such a great app. I've been coaching on there. I think it's definitely over a year now, uh, and it's just been so so fun, so helpful. I've um, I've helped so many disc golfers literally around the world at this point. There are people over in Europe who have sent me videos and it's just so cool and so exciting. Um, at least I believe that person was in Norway. That was my understanding. But anyway, um, if you need help, go ahead and send me a video on GiveGo. You can use dis uh, discount code Rogero. It's in the description and also on the rolling ticker periodically throughout this video. Um, you can go ahead and use that to get a free first session. So let's go ahead and let's transition to the next segment. Now, before we do that, okay, like I mentioned, we have a very short disc review. Before we do that, I just want to encourage and remind everyone, I am selling Maui Strong shirts. You'll see them in the description if you're on YouTube. They're on my Instagram and on the website, link in the description as well. Maui Strong shirts to support the Maui Strong Fund to help those in need who suffered great devastation from the wildfires on the island of Maui, specifically in the area of Lahaina. So many are in need. Okay, and all proceeds, all proceeds from every single purchase of one of the two Maui Strong shirts goes directly to the Maui Strong Fund. I am keeping zero profits. Okay, everything is going to these people who need it so much more. So please, I want to encourage you to order one of these shirts and you'll get the shirt sent to you. And we will then, as a Gladiator Disc Golf community, be able to send that money to people in need. Thank you so much if you've already ordered a shirt or if you do go order a shirt, thank you so much uh, for your kindness and your generosity. I truly appreciate it, but I know those people in need on the island of Maui will appreciate it even more. All right, so like I mentioned earlier, next week we'll I'll have the disc review on the Innova Aero, but just some preliminary things I wanna talk about here, very quick, very short. It's a Halo plastic, which is really cool. I have not spent a lot of time throwing Halo discs, but the uh, Aero is a two speed, uh, excuse me, three speed, six glide, zero turn, zero fade, putt and approach disc. Uh, it is, I believe, the first disc that Innova made, if I'm remembering correctly. This is the 40th anniversary, okay? Uh, 1983, which is, this is a piece of history, this mold, and I'm super honored and excited uh, to be holding it and to be able to throw it. And obviously this disc itself isn't 40 years old. I'm pretty sure those are brittle and they would break in a heartbeat and they are probably in the Disc Golf Hall of Fame in Appling, Georgia. But um, this disc is quite tall in the hand. It doesn't necessarily have like dominus because it is flat on top, but the shoulder comes up quite high. So it definitely feels uh, comparable to a lid or an ultimate frisbee, whatever you like to call it with the height and everything. And so it's a very smooth transition for those kinds of players. Um, I don't have a ton to say about the flight yet because I'm still figuring it out, still dialing it in. But I wanted to just share some preliminary thoughts about that, you know, how the plastic feels. It's nice and flexible, but uh, has some good stiffness to it to kind of absorb and uh, maintain shape. And then very tall, pretty wide, and it is beadless. So just gotta keep messing around with it. It is very different from the putters that I currently throw which would be the Mint Bullet, uh, which is a much shallower 
putter, at least in hand feel. I don't know the measurements comparison off the top of my head, but the bullet is a lot more shallow than the arrow. Next week, I'll have more information about the flight and sort of what I think about that, but I'm very excited to review the arrow with you guys in more detail. Now let's go ahead and let's recap Jim Palmieri's 50th AFDO presented by Dynamic Discs. This tournament has been going on since 1974. It's, it's, it's awesome, but it's really hard to believe that this tournament's been going on for that long. And it is just so cool to see that. Uh, that, that is real disc golf history. Um, I will say I've been watching on CCDG. I'm actually recording on a Sunday night, so all of the coverage isn't even out yet, and I currently don't have live anymore right now. That's a whole discussion for another time. Uh, but from what I've seen and the coverage I have watched, it's a very cool course. I've really enjoyed this course. It's different. There's a lot of OB um, stakes and lines OB, not necessarily water, but there's a lot of OB. It seems challenging, but it's a beautiful course from everything that I have seen. It's in Rochester, New York, in upstate New York, right near Lake Ontario. Beautiful piece of property. Um, I will say that this is a, a little factoid I got from Nate Perkins and Randon Lada, I believe is who uh, uh, else was doing commentary in round one. They said that, you know, when they give the tour cards out in the beginning of the year, pretty much the players sign up for every tournament without necessarily looking at the dates. And as things get closer and they figure some stuff out, a lot of major top tier pros realize that Worlds in Vermont starts on Wednesday, this Wednesday, three days from the recording of this, the day after I published this episode. The uh, 50th anniversary, the 50th AFDO ends on Sunday in New York. So players will then have to take Monday, drive up to Vermont, and then they'll have maybe half a day on that Monday and then one full day on Tuesday to practice for Worlds, which is then a five-day event, Wednesday through Sunday. And so, understandably so, many of these top-tier pros decided to drop out of this event. Now, it gave a, uh, obviously a ton of space and room for other players to go in and play, you know, more local players, but um, that is totally understandable. Like, I mean, I when you're talking about an A-tier Silver Series type deal versus the World Championships, I totally understand why some players would choose one over the other, meaning Worlds over this uh, A-tier. However, I also understand why some players would choose to play a tournament because it keeps them in that zone. They're getting that competitive play and feeling and they're really honing in some of the skills that they're going to need. This course was wooded. They had, excuse me, they had some fairways, but every fairway had obstacles to throw through and around. And that's the same thing that they're going to see at Smuggler's Notch. So it isn't necessarily a bad practice course or a bad practice tournament, okay, to be to have if you're preparing for Worlds. And if you've spent a lot of time at Smuggler's, I mean, you know it's a tough course, can never have too much practice there. But I think it kind of just depends on do you want to practice the course itself? And so I think vast majority of pros said, I'm going to Smug's Notch <laughs> and I'm going to go practice there. While some other pros decided, I want the tournament environment. I want that experience. I want to uh, be building on that momentum because I've been playing every weekend all year. And now I don't want to take a break and sort of lose some of that mojo. So I totally get that. I don't necessarily think one way is right or wrong. I will say, I'm, I will try to remember this, so future Antonio, uh, keep this in mind, that <clears throat> I will probably take a look to see how the players who played in Jim Palmieri's 50th AFDO, uh, how they, if those who played there, how they placed at Worlds. It'll be very interesting to kind of see if there's any correlation there. Now, granted, the talent pool at AFDO is gonna be a lot larger, so it won't necessarily be a perfect translation or comparison, but it could work. Now, that being said, this event did end today. So let's go ahead and let's look at the results. I'm super excited to announce that in first place, we had Ezra Robinson at minus 31. In second place, we had Matty O at minus 25. Third place, Connor Rock at minus 15. That's a 16-stroke separation between first and third. 
Fourth place, Jake Wolf, the guy who throws forehands and thumbers, uh, minus 13. Fifth place, GT Hancock, minus 12. Sixth place, Zachary Nash, minus 11. Seventh place, Tony Farrow at minus 10. Tied for eighth, Levi Hancock, Nick Newton, and Calvin Caldwell at minus nine. So a huge disparity in scores. First to second was six strokes. Uh, Second to third was 10 strokes. And so first to third, 16 strokes. Big, big uh, separation. Um, In FPO, I have not seen any coverage for for FPO, but we had uh, some really cool stuff actually. This is really cool. Okay, first place, Chantel Badinsky, minus seven. She her she is PDGA number 100, 130, 342. So 130,342 is her PDGA number. Second place, uh, Colleen McKinnis at plus two, a nine-stroke victory. Third place, we had Holly Finley and Ellen Widboom at plus four. And uh, Colleen at plus two. Fifth place, uh, Sandy Hendel at plus 10. Oh, Sandy Hendel. I recognize that last name. Martin Hendel, I believe, played in the MPO. Um, I wonder if that's uh, his wife. Uh, Sixth place, Caitlin Clay at plus 13. Seventh place, Raven Klein, a touring pro at plus 14. Uh, Eighth place, Elena Vinsky at plus 17. Ninth place, Hannah Stefanovic at plus 19. And then 10th place, Kat Johnson at plus 23. There were only 16 women, uh, or excuse me, 17 women, because there was a tie for second, 17 women, 16 or 17 women in FPO. So a much smaller field. MPO only had 82, which made it a much smaller field as well. But those are the results of that event. Now, but the thing that I'm most excited about for this week, we have the World Championships at Smuggler's Notch in Vermont. This is such a cool course. This course is on tour every single year, except this year it's hosting the World Championships. The last time it did that was in 2018, where Greg Barsby and Paige Bjorkis, who is now Paige Shu, won their first and only world titles. So it was super exciting to watch them. That was actually the same year I got into disc golf. I got into disc golf around March 2018. And then they went and won it in uh, August. I think it was around August time, August or, or September around that time at Smuggler's Notch, which is super cool. This year, very different than 2018. 2023 Worlds is presented by L.L. Bean, which is huge up in that area of the country. I remember growing up in the Northeast, we always had the L.L. Bean magazines coming in the mail. So really nice stuff. And it's crazy to think that they are sponsoring the World Championships. Um, Very, very cool. This course, guys, is beautiful. It is technical. It is challenging, but it is beautiful. We're going to have some amazing World Championship disc golf. I am very, very excited. Now, everything comes down to who's going to win. Everybody wants to know, who do you think is going to win? Who do you think is going to win? I think this person's going to win. Um, I got to say, I am torn between thinking that a winner will repeat. I think there's a higher chance we have a repeat world champion, not necessarily a repeat from last year, but just somebody else win another world title. I think somebody repeating as a champion at some point, that you know, from whenever they won their first one or most recent one, I think truly that is more likely, but I want a new world champion, okay? I can't make picks yet because it's not available, but I will say I think someone like Paul McBeth, he played great in Europe at the end of the European leg and really on fire online playing super, super clean golf. He's obviously going to be a favorite as six-time champion, um, Calvin Heinberg's going to be a favorite and he's never won. So it's like, okay, Calvin's been performing so well all year. Gannon Burr has been performing well all year. Isaac Robinson, now Ezra Robinson performing well all year. Prodigy has three, potentially four. If Kevin Jones has a great week, four guys that could very easily go and win the world championships. Um, and then you also have someone like Ricky, who's been, you know, 
who's had a great season, even barring some injuries. And he's just been really kind of like flying under the radar. He's always been quite there. He's won a couple events, I believe, uh, but he hasn't had a dominating year because he's missed time with injuries, but he has played well the last couple of weekends. And so I could see him coming out of the woodwork, so to speak, air quotes around that for those of you who are listening. So I think Ricky winning is definitely a possibility. And so that's kind of where I'm like, oh, a repeat winner, you know, would be cool. Greg Barsby, I would love for Greg Barsby to win a second world title. It's going to be tough, but I would love for him to do that. And then I have all those feelings about that repeat world champion. And I'm like, whoo, it'd be really cool to have one of those younger kids win, right? Having a new world champion. Specifically, I'm like, you know what? Everybody else has paid their dues or that everybody else still has to pay a few more dues. Let's see a Calvin Heimberg world champion. Let's see an Eagle McMahon world champion. Let's see a Simon Lazat world champion, right? Let's see a Chris Dickerson world champion. Some of these guys who have been on tour for years who have always played consistently well. Let's see one of them win a world championship. That would just be awesome. And the same goes for FPO. You know, it's obvious Kristen Tatar is going to be the favorite. More than likely, Kristen Tatar is going to win, just statistically speaking. But I would love to see Owen Scoggins win a world championship. Just won her first Elite Series Disc Golf Pro Tour event last week, but been on the podium 15 plus times to now all of a sudden go and be crowned world champion. I think she has proven that she doesn't need the distance that other players have because she plays smart, consistent golf and doesn't allow anything to get in the way of her game plan, not even weather conditions. So she would be a great first time world champion, but it would also be really cool to see someone like Ella Hansen or Holland Hanley win as a new world champion. Um, it's sad that Paige Pierce isn't going to be playing. At least I haven't seen anything on socials that Paige is already healthy enough to go play a world championship. But it's it's quite a bummer that she won't be there. All right. And then we also have Katrina Allen, who's won two world championships, most recently two years ago. And so could she be going for her third? Her year's been uh, up and down, mainly up, but some pretty, uh, but some downs as well. So it'd be really interesting to see how she performs this year, especially that Paige is not in the picture as far as I know, and it's just Kristen. So a lot of things, truthfully, I am so torn between a repeat winner and a new champion. I just know I'm gonna be so happy for whoever it is, and I cannot wait. Um, but to kind of round out the rest of the show, as the you know as we uh, come to end things here and we're getting ready for World Championships, I want to just run through uh, the list of previous winners from the last couple of years. So let's go ahead and we will start with MPO. We're not going to start in 1982 when they first did it, but last year, 2022, we had Paul Macbeth. All right, he beat out Aaron Gossage, if you remember that, in an epic final round. We had Paul Macbeth in 2022, James Conrad in 2021. It was canceled in 2020 due to COVID-19, but then we had Paul Macbeth in 2019. 2018, Greg Barsby. 2017, Ricky Wysocki. 16, Ricky Wysocki. 15, Paul Macbeth. 14, Paul Macbeth. 13, Paul Macbeth. 12, Paul Macbeth. 2011, Nate Doss. 2010, Eric McCabe, 09, Avery Jenkins, 08, David Felberg, 07, Nate Doss. And we'll stop here. The winningest world championship, the last time he won, is in 06, Ken Climo, when he won his 12th world championship. Um, now, I talked about this a little last week. This is why I do not think that Calvin and Gannon are at another point about them not being at the Paul and Ricky level. On uh, This is on Wikipedia. But <clears throat> if you go to that period of time, started go, um, going from 2019 and back, and looking at Paul and Ricky World Championships, I want you to listen. I want you guys to listen. This is why the Paul and Ricky rivalry was so legendary. Okay, for this for this time, we I know we had Ken Climo and Barry Schwartz and uh, a couple other guys, but this is why Calvin and Gannon quite aren't here yet. 
2019, the winner was Paul McBeth. Runner-up, Ricky Wysocki. 2017, winner was Ricky. Runner-up, Paul McBeth. 2016, Ricky won. Paul was runner-up. 2015, Paul won. Ricky was runner-up. 2014, Paul won. Ricky was runner-up. 2012, Paul won. Ricky was runner-up. So from 2012 to 2019, Paul and Ricky combined for first and second place in one, two, three, four, five, six out of, I think, eight world championships. Six out of eight world championships, Paul and Ricky finished first and second and just alternated. That is the rivalry, okay? <laughs> that is why it captivated the disc golf world. And now let's go and let's go back and talk about FPO recent winners. So in 2022, we had Kristen Tatar win her first one. Katrina Allen won in 21. 2020 was canceled. In 2019, Paige Pierce got her fifth. 2018, Paige Bjorkis got her first. 2017, Paige Pierce. 16, Valerie Jenkins. 2015, Paige Pierce. 2014, Katrina Allen got her first. 2013, Paige Pierce. 2012, Sarah Hokum. 2011, Paige Pierce. 2010, Sarah Stanhope. And then Valerie Jenkins won 2009, 2008, 2007. And then in 2006, you had Des Redding win it then and in 05. So just very cool history that we see. We see a lot of repeat winners in professional disc golf win multiple world championships. We have these repeat winners. It just tends to happen when that player's in their prime. They tend to just kind of have it all click. But we have never, as far as based on conversations and people who have been around the sport way longer than I've been around the sport, we've never had this concentrated of a pool of talent. And that's why I think it's so interesting. And we don't really know what's going to happen this year, being like we didn't really know the last couple of years that the talent pool is becoming so much more concentrated, so much more competitive, that it's like, it's not just a guarantee that Paul is going to finish on the podium. It's not just a guarantee that Calvin's going to finish on the podium or Ricky's going to finish on the podium or, you know, I think FPO might be a little different story, but in MPO, it's definitely not a guarantee for any of those players because there have been, I think there was a, a, a graphic I saw, 18 different winners for MPO this year. That is ridiculous. That's how talented the MPO division is. So, all that to say, I am very excited. I hope you are excited as well. I will be traveling this week. I am going to Florida later this week. I'm going to go see some family and see some friends for Labor Day weekend. We're going to be playing some disc golf. I am absolutely stoked to get in Florida, play some disc golf and have fun. So make sure that you go out this week and that you teach someone how to play disc golf, be an encouragement to them, give them some positive uh, tips and some encouragement to help them on their disc golf journey. Make sure that you also get out and play some disc golf this week. I was amped. I got to play a couple rounds earlier today on Sunday afternoon. It was a blast. Um, I had fun. I want you to go have fun. Go play some disc golf. And until next time, everybody, have a great round.